The Cellar. Ryan Thomas Waller was born on February 12, 1988, in Phoenix, Arizona. He grew up in Maricopa County. Maricopa County is in the south central part of Arizona. The county has a population of over 4 million people, which is about 62% of the state's total residents. This makes Maricopa County the fourth most populous county in the United States and the most populated county in all of Arizona. Ryan had a relatively normal upbringing, and according to reports, he graduated high school and had aspirations of one day being in a big time rock band. At a young age, Ryan picked up the guitar and had taught himself how to play, slowly getting better and better with time. It was said that he could learn how to play a song by simply listening to it once over. Following his graduation from high school, 18-year-old Ryan and his girlfriend, Heather Kwan, would eventually move in to a house together. I've seen varying reports, with some saying that Ryan and Heather had been together a few years, and others stating it was only about eight months that they had been together. Either way, Ryan and Heather had reportedly known each other for quite some time prior to their friendship blossoming into a budding romance. That now brings us to December 25th, 2006. It was Christmas Day, and the couple was planning on heading over to Ryan's family's house for Christmas dinner. According to reports, the couple had decided to sit down and watch a movie prior to their dinner plans. As this is going on, Ryan's father and mother were preparing their house for the couple's arrival, cooking dinner, and making sure everything was perfect for that Christmas evening. As the expected arrival time came and went, Don Waller, Ryan's father, would place a phone call to his son. He would get no answer, which was very unusual. It wasn't like their son to not show up or call to let them know what was going on. Following dinner, Don Waller would once again make an effort to reach out to his son, and his call once again would go unanswered. This worried Ryan's parents tremendously, and so they made the decision to hop in their car and take a trip over to Ryan's apartment. They would arrive at Ryan's apartment just before 8 p.m. Christmas evening. They went up and knocked on the door, but no one answered. Being further alarmed by not being able to locate their son, Don Waller would get on the phone and call the police department to come to Ryan's place and do a wellness check. Police dispatch would inform Don that someone would be in touch with him, and according to reports, it took three hours before an officer eventually showed up to Ryan's house to do that wellness check. This now brings us to somewhere around 11 to 11.30 p.m. The officers would finally arrive at Ryan's house. They approached the front door and knocked and got no answer. They then shined their lights through the house's windows and spotted what they believed to be a body on the floor within the home. Now, where I live, Typically, if an officer sees that a person is potentially injured or unconscious within their home, they will use this as probable cause to enter the residence. But for some reason, the officers in this case did not immediately enter the home. Instead, they asked Ryan's parents to back away from the property, and then they set up crime scene tape around the residence. They then called it in and awaited a warrant to enter the home. This warrant wouldn't be obtained for close to another hour from the time they first noticed what they believed to be a body within Ryan's home. Finally having a warrant, the police first attempted to use a locksmith to open the front door of the residence. When this ultimately failed, they then turned their attention to the back door of the home. As they proceeded to try and get the back door unlocked, to the police's surprise, Ryan Waller would unlock the door and open it, letting them into the residence. Upon entering the residence, it became immediately apparent to the police that something terrible had occurred within the home. Ryan's face looked badly injured and beaten up. But what really caught their attention even further was the body that they noticed unmoving on the couch. The police would slowly approach and find Heather Kwan, Ryan's girlfriend, slumped over on the couch. It appeared she had had her life taken by an apparent gunshot wound 
to the head. Now, this is where the story goes from tragic to downright terrifying, as the police would immediately form their own conclusions. They quickly made the assumption that Ryan's injuries were defensive wounds from Heather, making Ryan the perpetrator in all that had gone down. They soon began arresting the extremely confused Ryan Waller. As the police attempted to arrest Ryan, Ryan kept asking him the question, what is going on? This only aggravated the police even further, and as they continued to yell at Ryan to get on the ground, the police would soon turn to force to get Ryan to comply. The officers allegedly knocked Ryan face first onto the ground. During the process of arresting him, Ryan would suffer a broken jaw to add to the numerous injuries he had already been found with. Ryan would soon be taken out of the apartment in handcuffs and placed in the back of a police cruiser. As Ryan sat in the cruiser, the police would begin processing the scene of the crime inside. An ambulance would eventually arrive and they would enter the house and examine Heather Kwan. But following the examination, they simply left without once looking over Ryan or any of his various injuries. It was ever apparent at this point that the police were working with tunnel vision. They made an assumption that Ryan had ended his girlfriend's life, and in assuming that, they weren't going to do anything to accommodate him or any of the injuries he had suffered. To make matters worse, Ryan would be left sitting in that cop car for close to four hours before the lead detective, Paul Dalton, would finally instruct an officer to drive Ryan back to the police station for questioning. At the station, Ryan would be fingerprinted, and the police would take numerous pictures documenting the injuries all over Ryan's body. Following his booking, Ryan would then be placed in a room to await interrogation by Detective Dalton. I will now share some of the interrogation with you all. I want to say that some of it can be tough to watch. Throughout the interrogation, it becomes very apparent that Ryan is not acting normal. To be honest, it's downright obvious that he needs medical attention. Now, I am someone who supports the police and the many great detectives all throughout the world. Some of those that do the job take it very seriously and their dedication should always be commended. But at the same time, when officers display sheer incompetence and arrogance, they should be called out and criticized. I will never shy away from expressing my criticism of everything that went on during this story. Heather, what's her last name? 
Um, I don't know which name she's trying to use as her last one. Christina was on the couch? Heather was. Heather was on the couch. He told me Christina was on the couch just a minute ago. I don't know, man. I really don't. I really don't. You just don't know? I really don't, man. You don't want to tell me. I really don't know, man. I really don't. I just want to go and go to sleep, man. Man, you're not going to go anywhere. You know what happened in your house last night? Mm-hmm. Is that house yours? Mm-hmm. Yours or your parents? Mine. You bought that house? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, what happened? Well, these people came over. Richie and his dad. With shoot and arrow, bow and darts. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They hit me and her with those. That's it. And Heather wasn't there. And Eric wasn't there. It was just me and Heather. Who was there? You and Heather were there. And then what happened? And that's it. Richie and his dad tried to break in. He's back. Richie and dad? His dad? Mm hmm. Who's Richie? I don't know. They hit you and. They hit you? Yeah. Now it's Richie that hit you? Not Heather? No, Richie and his dad. Richie and his dad. They hit you? Yes. Why? Because they're trying to get their stuff. I don't know why. And they had some kind of bow and arrows? Mm-hmm. They each had two revolvers and they didn't let off any shells. Okay, you just said they had bow and arrows. Now they have revolvers? That's what I meant. They had revolvers. They have revolvers? Yes. And then what happened? And then they sh** us those. Ryan, why don't you tell me what really happened there? Because I don't believe... I really don't know, man. I really don't. I don't know. I could tell you anything, I swear. Well, I want you to tell me the truth. That's all I want. Richie and his dad came there. And I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't... And you've been sh** in the eye. Yes. That's it. Put your feet up to the table, please. My feet hurt, man. I don't know why. Get them off my table. Let me see your nose. Put your, put, your legs, put your legs down. Put your legs down. Bring, bring your face closer. Oh, my head hurts. Take a look at it. They're, they're going to probably take you to the hospital. You're taking me to the hospital? Yeah, we're going to take you to the hospital. Why? Well, if you've seen your face and the way you're doing things, it just it doesn't make sense right now, okay? We're just going to make sure you're okay. I can't go back to bed, man. Well, that's the problem. If you have some kind of head injury, you shouldn't be sleeping, okay? Well, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. There you go. All right. By the end of the interrogation, the police would finally call for an ambulance to bring Ryan to the hospital. During the interview, Ryan's story and answers were simply all over the place. Not remembering his girlfriend's name or age, not remembering if he himself had graduated from high school. At one point he stated that he owned the house he was living in, which was simply not true. To be frank, it blows my mind that it took as long as it did before police realized how bad off Ryan truly was. Either Detective Dalton was truly oblivious to what was going on with Ryan, or he simply didn't care about his well-being whatsoever. I lean towards the latter being the case. So how bad was Ryan? Well, this is the most unbelievable part of the story, as Ryan had arrived at the hospital in critical condition. At the hospital, the doctors found that Ryan had multiple gunshot wounds to the head. On top of the gunshot wounds, the doctors found his jaw to have been broken and according to reports, this injury had occurred after the gunshots, seemingly by the police as they attempted to arrest Ryan. Doctors would turn their focus to the gunshot wounds. 
and the doctor soon found that one of the bullets had gone through Ryan's sinus cavity and straight into his brain, shattering part of his skull in the process. As a result of this, an infection soon developed and they had to wait numerous days to get the infection under control before they could finally go in to do surgery to remove the bullet. Once they were finally able to do the surgery, doctors had to remove part of Ryan's brain as well as both of his eyes during the procedure. Luckily, they were able to save and subsequently reattach one of his eyes, but Ryan's life would simply never be the same again. At this point, Ryan had been delayed medical attention for well over six hours, and during that time, an infection formed, and his brain continued to swell and bleed. If he had been rushed to a hospital sooner, the outcome may have been more favorable for Ryan, but ultimately we will never know. The poor young man had to suffer for hours at the hands of the police department, the very people whose jobs are to protect and serve. After 35 days in the hospital, Ryan was finally released into the care of his parents. As I stated before, Ryan's life would never be the same again. He no longer could care for himself, and he needed 24-7 attention. To add on to what this young man was going through, he would suffer horrible seizures following his release from the hospital. These seizures would ultimately plague him for the rest of his life. So what actually happened to Ryan Waller and Heather Kwan? Well, during Ryan's interrogation, he did manage to give the police some truth about what happened on the night of December 25th. As known criminal Richie Carver and his father Larry Carver had broken into the couple's home while they were watching a movie. According to reports, Ryan heard a noise at the back door, and when he went to see what was going on, he was confronted by Richie Carver, who subsequently sh Ryan twice in the head before turning his attention to Heather Kwan, who was scared and still sitting on the couch. Richie would then walk right up to Heather and shoot her point blank in the head before proceeding to rob the couple of anything of value within their home. Both Richie and his father had been in trouble with the law numerous times prior to this senseless act of violence. To put it as simply as I can, these two are some of the worst of the worst humanity has to offer. Now you may ask, why did they choose this house on Christmas? Well, the thought behind that is that Richie had actually lived in that house prior to Ryan and Heather living there. From my research into this case, Richie had lived there with a friend prior to that friend eventually kicking Richie out. I've also seen some reporting that Richie had lived in the residence with Ryan prior to Heather moving in, but I'm not certain if that's actually the case or not. In the aftermath of Ryan and Heather moving in together, there was actually some reported sightings of Richie showing up around the residence. When confronted by Ryan about why he was at their house, Richie would use the excuse that he was there to see if some of his mail had been delivered. But it's ultimately believed that Richie may have been casing the place in order to eventually perform a robbery. Being that Richie lived there, he had knowledge of the house's floor plan and how the back door of the residence worked. Many believe that he and his father decided to rob the home on Christmas Eve with the thought that no one would be home when they did so, due to the holiday. There's also been a report that Richie and Ryan had had an altercation prior to the incident and that Richie was there to get a form of payback on Ryan. At the end of the day, it's simply not 100% clear cut as to what was ultimately motivating Richie and his father, Larry, on that fateful night. Following Ryan's departure from the hospital, the police would finally sit down and speak to Ryan again. And it was after this interview that the police were finally able to apprehend and arrest Richie Carver. Soon after Richie Carver's arrest, Larry Carver's wife would come to the police station and give them information about Larry's involvement in the murder. Eventually, the pair would have their day in court, and both would end up convicted and sentenced to life in prison. At the very least, the police were able to get some semblance of justice for Ryan and Heather. But the treatment that Ryan Waller endured at the hands of the Phoenix Police Department is simply unforgivable. Now, I do want to say really quickly that I found a lot of discrepancies in my research on this case. In telling the entire story, I've tried to piece together what truly transpired while also sharing some of the relevant differences that have been reported. So if anything I have shared is incorrect, I do apologize as I always try to report the stories as accurately as humanly possible. With some information not being crystal clear, the real point in me sharing this case was to highlight what Ryan endured following the crime the Carvers had committed. Ryan was a victim just as much as Heather had been. But from the jump, the police zeroed in on Ryan being the perpetrator. 
from that moment on, he was treated less than human, literally being interrogated with his skull shattered and a bullet lodged in his brain. After everything that transpired in this story, Ryan's parents would eventually sue the city of Phoenix for the mishandling of Ryan Waller's case. The family spent four years preparing for the lawsuit, but sadly, the case was dismissed just three weeks prior to the trial by an apparently biased judge. This means that absolutely no one involved in Ryan's case saw any kind of punishment for how terribly it was all handled. In fact, the city of Phoenix hired a doctor who went on record to state that the delay of medical care had no effect on the outcome of Ryan's injuries, which just is not true. When it comes to head trauma of any kind, time is very much of the essence. To add more to the tragedy that is this story, Ryan Waller would continue to struggle every day until January 20th of 2016. On that day, Ryan would suffer another horrible seizure while within a grocery store. The seizure would end up causing a brain bleed and Ryan Waller would pass away at the young age of 27 years old. At the end of the day, the police department never once apologized for what occurred. Ryan was denied sufficient medical treatment for numerous hours. He was interrogated and treated like he himself was the monster in his own tragic story. In telling this case, I hope to shine a light on the horrible treatment Ryan Waller endured. As much as it is a positive that the perpetrators were locked away for life, it's simply terrible that no one took accountability for the less than human-like treatment that Ryan had to endure. Ryan Waller deserved better, and he was failed by the very system that was supposed to protect him. My deepest condolences go out to Ryan Waller's family and friends. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. If you enjoy the content, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps the channel continue to grow. Also, you can check the description box below and find the link to my merch store. Tons of awesome designs and the proceeds help fund the channel. For those of you that are interested, I have a Cellar Dwellers membership tier for the channel. It's just $2.99 a month. It comes with some pretty cool perks. So if that interests you, then please go check it out. I also have that linked in the description box below. If you'd like to submit a real life scary story that you would like featured on an episode of the channel, please do so using the email linked in the description box below. As always, I do all the research, writing, recording, and editing for the channel myself, so anything that you do to support the channel is greatly appreciated. Until next time, I will see you all again as we head back into the cellar.